Hello everybody, my name is Zoe and I work at The Reading Agency, a national charity that's mission is to tackle life's big challenges through the proven power of reading. We deliver our programmes in partnership with public libraries, schools, prisons and many others. And in the past year, we have reached over 1.8 million people nationwide. I'm joined today by Janet Skeslin Charles, the award winning author of the novels Moonlight in Odessa and the Paris Library, which was published in February this year. Janet's latest book is based on the true story of the heroic librarians at the American Library in Paris, who fought to keep the library open during the Nazi occupation. Moving between 1940s Paris and 1980s Montana, the story focuses on librarian Odile and the people she meets while working at the library. We also meet 12 year old Lily, the much older Odile's next door neighbour, with whom she strikes up an unexpected friendship. It's an unforgettable novel of romance, friendship, family, and the heroism found in the quietest of places. And I'm delighted to be speaking uh, with Janet today all about the book. So hi, Janet. <laughs> Hello, Zoe. It's lovely to be here. Thank you for having me. No, my pleasure. Um, so would you mind starting us off with a short reading from the Paris Library? Absolutely. Well, this is Odile in Paris, February 1939. Numbers floated around my head like stars. Eight, two, three. The numbers were the key to a new life, 822, constellations of hope, 841. In my bedroom late at night, in the morning on the way to get croissants, series after series, 8110, 840, 890, formed in front of my eyes. They represented freedom, the future. Along with numbers, I had studied the history of libraries, going back to the 1500s. In England, while Henry VIII was busy chopping off his wise heads, our King Francois was modernizing his library, which he opened to scholars. His royal collection was the beginning of the bibliotheque, as you know. Now, at the desk in my bedroom, I prepared for my job interview at the American Library, reviewing my notes one last time. Founded in 1920, the first library in Paris to let the public into the stacks. Subscribers from more than 30 countries, one fourth of them from France. I held fast to these facts and figures, hoping they'd make me appear qualified to the directress. I strode from my family's apartment on the city route alone, across from the Saint Lazare train station, where locomotives coughed up smoke. The wind whipped my hair, and I tucked tendrils under my tan hat. In the distance, I could see the dome of Saint Augustin Church, Religion 200, Old Testament 221. New Testament? I waited, but the number wouldn't come. I was so nervous that I forgot simple facts. I drew my notebook from my purse. Ah, yes, 225, I knew that. My favorite part of library school had been the Dewey Decimal System. Conceived in 1873 by the American librarian Melville Dewey, it used 10 classes to organize library books on, book on shelves based on subject. There was a number for everything, allowing any reader to find any book in any library. For example, Mama took pride in her 648 for housekeeping. Papa wouldn't admit it, but he really did enjoy 785 chamber music. My twin brother was more of a 636.8 person, while I preferred 633.7, Captain Madonna's respectively. I arrived on the Grand Boulevard, where in the space of a block, the city shrugged off her working class mantle and donned a new coat. The coarse smell of coal dissipated, replaced by the honeyed jasmine of joy worn by women delighting in the window display of Nina Ritchie's dresses and Kislev Green leather gloves. Further along, I wound around musicians exiting the shop that sold wrinkled sheet music, past the Baroque building with the blue door, and turned the corner onto a narrow side street. I knew the way by heart. I loved Paris, a city with secrets. Like book covers, some leather, some cloth, each Parisian door led to an unexpected world. A courtyard could contain a knot of bicycles or a plump concierge armed with a broom. In the case of the library, a massive wooden door opened to a secret garden. Bordered by petunias on one side, long on the other, the white pebbled path led to a brick and stone mansion. I crossed the threshold beneath the French and American flags, glittering side by side, and hung my jacket on a rickety coat rack. Breathing in the best smell of the world, a melange of the mossy scent of musty books and crisp newspaper pages, I felt as if I'd come home. 
Thank you. That was a lovely introduction. Um, and I especially like the uh, description of Paris as a, a city with secrets. I think that's really lovely. Um, so you worked yourself at the American Library in Paris as programs manager. Um, could you just tell me a bit about what it was like working there and what place does the library hold in Paris's kind of wider cultural landscape? Well, I really enjoyed the job. My um, role was to invite authors and uh, journalists to speak every week and to hold, um, to take part in the um, evenings with an author series. So it was a lot of fun to reach out to different authors that I, I wanted to hear more about. I always stood in the back and was taking notes um, because I just, every, everything they said was so interesting and I just absolutely loved hearing it. The American Library um, has uh, 60 different nationalities in its membership, so it's very international. 25% of the membership is French, so you can see there are a lot of uh, French people who love the library as well. Um, I think what's interesting is that it's a, the membership is a cross-section of people that you wouldn't normally see. There are uh, millionaires, families on a budget, students, retirees, uh, very conservative, very liberal, and they all come for the communion of books. So it's, it's a really interesting place. Amazing. Yeah, and, and your job role in particular sounds fantastic. I can't imagine being somewhere where you get to meet so many authors. It sounds like a kind of Parisian literary salon or something. Um, so how, how commonplace is it to have kind of um, a national library in a foreign city like having the American Library in Paris? And I think you also mentioned um, the Russian Library in Paris as well. Is that something that you see in kind of lots of places around the world? I haven't seen so many. I know when I was in Kiev, there was a British Council library that was absolutely beautiful. Uh, but I know there's a there's a Russian library here in Paris. There's a Ukrainian library. Uh, there's a I think there's a British Council li uh, library here as well. So um, I think it depends on the city. Yeah, I suppose Paris is such a kind of um, big metropolitan city and has such a mix of of cultures. So it kind of makes sense to have libraries to kind of serve all these different communities in the city. Um, so could you tell us a little bit about what actually happened to the American Library in Paris during the occupation and kind of what everyday life was like for people living in the city at that time? Well, when the, when the Nazis arrived in June 1940, on, on day three of their arrival, they went into the Polish library, which is right behind Notre Dame, and they took the archives, they took the books. Uh, then they went into the Russian library, which is maybe a block away from where Shakespeare and Company is today. And the same took the, took, took the books, took the archives. Then they went to the U Ukrainian library and they even took the librarian. Uh, the director of the Bibliothèque Nationale was arrested. He was relieved of his functions and he was eventually sent to a concentration camp. And so you can see for libraries in Paris, it was a very serious situation. Um, at the American Library in Paris, the, um, the, the staff was, was very worried and um, one, of, one staff member was shot by the Gestapo. So it was a serious time. But at the beginning in June of 1940, uh, they, the library had visits from, from German officers and eventually uh, a man named Hermann Fuchs, who was the library, the Nazi library protector, came and interviewed Dorothy Reeder. She didn't recognize him right away. Uh, she was more concentrated on his uh, Nazi uniform, but they'd actually met at several international library conferences. And so, because the US wasn't at war with uh, Germany at that time, they were considered neutral. And so Dr. Fuchs said that she had to take the banned books out of her collection. She didn't have to destroy them, but they, they, could, not be, um, they could not be circulated. He also said that Jewish people were not allowed in the library. And so what happened was with the Countess, uh, of, the Countess from Ohio, Clara de Chambrand, who was a woman from Ohio who married a Frenchman, a, a French general, they decided that they would hand over books to Jewish readers. And so at the American Library in Paris, which was also very international then, the head librarian was, um, was from Russia. He became a French citizen. So he was Franco-Russian. The Countess de Claire de Chambrun, she was American, but she became French as well. So she was Franco-American. Uh, they hand delivered books to the readers. 
Yeah, and they're, they're characters that we, we see in the book um, as well. And you mentioned a few of the titles in particular that were kind of considered um, inappropriate books or books that were asked to be removed from the library. But what, what were the kind of books um, or what was kind of the criteria that was used to choose these books that shouldn't be um, kind of allowed to be borrowed by the public? I, I think anything that the Germans considered controversial or anyone, any books by Jewish authors, the, the, the Germans had a list called the auto list and it was several hundred books, uh, but they were the titles in French and, and the, the auto list was for French libraries. And so there was a question of, do the books in English have to be taken from the shelves? And I think what they decided to do was just loan the books to people that they knew well. Yeah, and the, and the people who were doing that job, who were taking these books to uh, Jewish subscribers who weren't able to access them themselves were kind of risking their own lives as well, because if they were kind of found out to be um, delivering this service, then they would have kind of been seen as part of the, as the enemy as well, wouldn't they? Yes, the rules changed from day to day, and so it was a very dangerous time. Uh, they just, the librarians from day to day did not know what would happen. Yeah, no, it, it sounds like incomprehensible. Um, so the American Library in Paris was quite unusual, as you said, it, because it had an open stack system. Um, so that's one where people can just kind of browse the books themselves and they're all kind of open on the shelves for people to see. Um, whereas a lot of libraries required you to ask a member of staff who often wasn't actually a librarian to go out and find the book for you. Um, so I just wanted to know what are your early memories of visiting libraries and how do you think the freedom of being able to browse books and discover them independent, independently um, kind of influences your kind of reading journey? Well, I'll, I'll say that recently I listened to a recording of the, of the director of the American Library in Paris in the 1950s. Uh, and so it was, a, it was a recording from the 1950s with a French female journalist and the director Ian Forbes Richer. And the, and the journalist had come to the library, she was looking around the stacks and she said, how, how are you not worried that people will, how shall I say this, steal books? And so even, even then, even after the war, there was this concern that people would some, steal books. And so the director, um, Ian Fraser Forbes said, no French people ever steal the books. If someone steals the books, it's usually an American who forgets about it. And when they return to America, they, they accidentally take the book with them, but they, they'll either send it back or they'll, you know, cover the costs. It's, but um, there was that misconception that people, if there were stacks um, left unattended, people, people would steal books. And so I thought that was really interesting, even in the 50s, that uh, the idea of an open stack system could be controversial. Um, I, I just love being able as a child to discover books on my own. And I think there's really something wonderful about being able to meander through the stacks. I know um, I worked when I worked at the American Library in Paris, um, like a lot of the support staff, we worked in a separate office. And so whenever we came into the library, my eye would always catch um, a different book, a different spine, a different color. And it was always special to um, have that connection with books. And I, every day I, I walked into every, several times a day I walked into the library and there was always that different book. And it was, it's always such a pleasure. Yeah, definitely. I think there's definitely something about like being physically surrounded by the books themselves, because in London, where I'm from, we have um, the British Library, uh, which, as I'm sure you know, is a closed stacks library. So you have to kind of order the books two days in advance and then they're all handled very carefully by the staff. And I mean, that's quite a particular library because I think it's mainly used for kind of academic research and stuff. But it is quite a kind of intimidating experience going in there and kind of, um, you know, having to request the books. But when you're kind of surrounded by them and you have them there, accessible just for you to pick up and feel and you know kind of flip to a page and have a little read and then put it back is is a really mm -hmm. wonderful experience I think um so just going back to the kind of story in the book so it occurred to me that we know a lot about the women who during the war took on jobs that were kind of formally done by men so um things like manual labor and um, farm work and things like that but i don't think we know so much about the women who already had jobs and then continued to do them throughout the war, war. 
So how common was it? Because um, Adele in, in the book, when she first gets her job at the American Library in Paris, has to kind of convince her dad that it's what she should be doing and that, you know, she, she should have a job, even though he can provide for her financially. So how common was it for women to have jobs at this time and to continue doing them throughout the war? Well, for me, um, just looking at the American Library in Paris, there were so many women who were working at the library, the directress, Dorothy Reeder. I couldn't write too much about them, but there was a mother-daughter team from Canada, um, which, can you imagine going to work with your mom every day? I just thought it would just be so wonderful. Um, and so, you know, they were far from home, just like Dorothy Reeder. Um, Phyllis Webb was the, Phyllis Webb was the bookkeeper from England. And so she, she also was here in, in Paris on her own. So um, Helen Fickweiler, from New England in the States, arrived uh, in Paris um, three weeks before the war broke out. So I can't really speak to, to French women, but I can say that um, women from Canada, England, and uh, the United States were traveling on their own, getting jobs on their own. Um, Phyllis Wedd is really interesting because she was interned as an um, it, enemy alien, and so she was interned in Eastern France um, simply because England was at war with France. And when she finished, or when she was released from from that imprisonment, she went right back to the library where she worked until she retired. And so I just think of her courage. Um, I think I would have gone home. Um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I would have been. Yeah, she stayed, and you know, she was a bookkeeper, which I think a lot of times was a man's job, um, and uh, just. I mean, all of her. Yeah, I mean, there's definitely a really strong kind of um, female presence in the story and working at the library. And it feels like it's the women who really kind of drive the effort to keep the library open. Um, and you mentioned Miss Reader there. And one of the other things I really love about the book is its host of kind of headstrong, heroic female characters. So I was just wondering if you could tell me a bit more about where you saw inspiration for the characters, particularly Miss Reader, um, who's the directress of the library, and also Professor Cohen, who is one of its uh, fiercely intellectual and witty subscribers. Well, um, one thing that Professor Cohen has in common uh, with the writer Simone de Beauvoir is that they both had to pass an aggregation. That's a really hard competitive examination. Very few people pass and even fewer women pass. And so it really, um, that's something in French culture that is very challenging. And so I, uh, I have a lot of uh, admiration for people who pass that test. So um, I was thinking of just the, the people at the time at the library, just the, the interesting, fascinating, um, they were called subscribers at the time. Unfortunately, um, when, the, when the Nazis started coming to the library more and more often and there were denunciations of members and of the staff and of the library itself, the library decided to burn the cards, the information cards of their members for the members' safety. Oh, right. So um, that's something that I, I didn't have access to because it no longer existed. But I, um, I did a lot of reading uh, that the Paris edition of the International Herald Tribune had um, sections every day. One was about the British colony in Paris, one was about the American colony in Paris. And so you can kind of see there was this colonization of the city um, by these people who came in and, and just loved it so much. Um, I, I was really in awe of the librarians as well. Uh, you know, Dorothy Reeder came here into Paris on her own in, in 1929 when she stayed here through, through most of the, through a lot of the war, she returned to the States um, where she worked for the Red Cross and raised money. And then she went to Bogota, Colombia and worked um, training librarians. So she worked um, on three continents, um, which a lot of us haven't done even today. Yeah, no, that's incredible. She sounds like an absolutely just amazing woman. I think she's the kind of person when people say, you know, if you could have dinner with one person or, you know, if you could spend an evening with one person, I think she would be such a fascinating person to sit down with and talk to. 
Um, so you said the book is an examination of the relationships that make us who we are. And one of the most enduring relationships in the book is that between uh, a much older Adil and her next door neighbour in Montana, which is where she moves to after the war, uh, Lily, who's 12. Um, what did the intergenerational relationship between Adil and Lily allow you to kind of uncover about both of them as characters? Well, I think the whole point of this book to me is the transmission of stories, just like we have transmission of stories in novels, we have transmissions of stories from friend to friend, from family members, and we pass these stories down. And so um, when I first sent out the book to agents um, and to editors, um, some people wanted me to cut the, the Lily story the, of, the, of, of the young character in Montana. Um, who is told this story by Odile. And to me, the whole point of the story is that Lily kind of inherits all of the people at the library. She inherits all of the subscribers and they live on through her. And so for me, that's a lot of, about inter, intergenerational friendships, um, you know, grandmother, granddaughter. Uh, it's just a wonderful relationship and it's very warm and there's not maybe the stress of, of raising someone. Um, and it's just, it, it's just, I think, a very cozy, warm relationship. I see my mother with her granddaughters, and it's really lovely to see. There's, um, she just delights in it, and that's really a pleasure. And that's what I was hoping for with Odile and Lily. Yeah, definitely. I mean, I, I couldn't really imagine the story in any other way without having Lily there, because I think she enables Odile, who's kind of been living quite a secluded life in Montana, um, to kind of really open up and, and access that part of her past and kind of... Um, you know, allow herself to, to, you know, go back to those memories again. So yeah, I really love that relationship between the two of them. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> so onto, onto you a bit now. So how did you come to be a writer and what are the stories and characters that you kind of find yourself being drawn to most frequently? Well, I've always been a writer. I've always, you know, had journals. I've always scribbled in my notebooks, in, in journals. I'm always taking notes. Um, when people are talking, I'm usually writing down what they're saying at some point. Watch out. Um, <laughs> so I'm just kind of figuring out what it means, what they're trying to say. Um, for me, I'm really drawn to places uh, like Montana or like Odessa or like Paris, they, they really strong sense of place. And within those, those settings, I really am interested in women who have to start over again, who have to create uh, or reinvent themselves after, after a loss or, or after a difficult situation and how they gather the strength to continue. Yeah, no, it's incredible. So you mentioned your first book, uh, Moonlight in Odessa. Um, and you lived in the Ukrainian capital for a while um, and obviously the Paris library moves between Montana where you're, where you're from originally and Paris where you live now. Mm -hmm. So how important is it for you to kind of experience firsthand the places where your books are set and could you ever imagine writing a book without ever having been to the, the city or the country where, where it takes place? I, I chose I chose to set the books there just because I love them so much, the places so much, and it's a wonderful way to, for example, I wrote the book Moonlight in Odessa when I was in Paris and I was missing Odessa, so it was kind of a way to go back there with my uh, in my mind and remember all of the small details that you need to to have in mind when you're writing a book. Um, I wrote a lot of this book in Paris in libraries, so I was maybe homesick and thinking of my own family and friends. Um, in, in Montana. And so for me, books, writing a book is a way to travel. I don't know that you need to go to a place to write it. And I think that would be sad because um, so much of a book, it, so much of writing is imagination. And so I, I would hate to limit myself and say, you know, you can't write about Vladivostok until you go there, um, especially now with COVID when we can't travel. Yeah, no, that's, that's very true. Um, so I first went to Paris when I was 16 um, and like Lily, um, I was completely obsessed with everything to do with Paris and kind of just the idea of the city. Um, I think a lot of that for me came from watching the film Amelie when I was uh, a bit a bit younger and um, that kind of just sparked this obsession with the city. Um, and you yourself studied French at the University of Montana uh, before moving to France to work as a teacher, after which you joined the American Library in Paris. 
Um, so when did your love of the French language and Paris and French culture begin? And why do you think it is that people like Lily, whose everyday lives might feel kind of a world away from Paris, uh, fall in love with the city? Um, well, I grew up next to a French war bride. And so this was in the 80s in Montana. And so she was from the city of Rouen and not far from the D-Day beaches. And she met an American soldier and um, they married and she uh, followed him back to Montana. And uh, she had a son and a daughter and uh, lived in Montana. But I, you know, she left her friends, her family, her career, uh, even her language behind. And so even when I was little, I was aware of just how courageous she was to, to leave her country behind like that and not really know if she could return. And so she was really a big inspiration for me when writing this book for the first five years. The book was actually called The War Bride because Odile was a war bride and probably maybe closer to 50% of the book took place in Montana and was, was a lot about what happened to Odile once she arrived in the States. And I did a lot of research um, on war brides and it's just fascinating. They're such amazing women. Definitely. Um, so the book is filled with really beautiful lines encapsulating the magic and importance of public libraries, uh, as well as their users and the librarians who work at them. Um, one of my favorite lines is from Miss Reader when she's writing a letter to the library's board in New York, uh, trying to persuade them as to why the library must remain open. And she says, libraries are lungs, books the fresh air, breathed in to keep the heart beating, to keep the brain imagining, to keep hope alive. And I just really love that line. Um, Libraries across the UK have worked tirelessly throughout the pandemic to continue serving the communities who rely on them. So we've seen people hand delivering books and making phone calls to isolated users and taking the joy of online author events or taking the joy of author events online. Um, so what do you think the role is of libraries in our society? I think libraries are so important because we aren't all born with the same advantages. And so to me, what libraries do is they really level the playing field so that everyone um, has the same access to knowledge, everyone has the same access to computers, everyone has the same access to, to books and to, to reading, um, because it really helps kids if they enjoy reading because so much of school, whether it's history class, um, or even um, story problems in math class, it comes down to reading. And if kids don't like books, it, it makes school very, very challenging for them. I know in the States, um, the um, libraries are lending things like ties and suits for job interviews. And so this means that someone who's from a disadvantaged background can look just as polished um, for a job interview as, as, as someone, someone else. So it really gives people an opportunity to shine um, and to me that's what libraries are they're just they're they are free um, and and they are for everyone yeah definitely I think as as you say they do so much more than just lending books they're kind of a space of community and safety and refuge um, and they play such an important role in so many different people's lives um, so many of the characters in the books turn uh, as so many of the characters uh, turn to books in terms of uh, in times of both personal and national crisis, uh, which is something that we've seen happening a lot during lockdown. Um, so why do you think it is that people turn to books at these times and has reading and writing helped you deal with the ongoing challenges of the past year? Well, I think people are spending more time at home and the news is really grim. And so I've seen people turn to reading. I've seen them turn to painting. I know um, I reread some children's classics. Um, I discovered Anne of Green Gables, which I'd never read before. And so it's just really maybe comforting. It's just a comforting exercise. And uh, it's also creative. You know, when you're reading, the book does half the work, but the reader does the other half with the imagining the characters, imagining the situation, trying to put ourselves into the shoes of the character. And so I think it's a really important thing to do. I did hear of a few people who just, the lockdown was so hard on them that they couldn't concentrate and they couldn't read. And that was a real hardship for them. 
Yeah, no, I think I think I kind of moved through both at the very beginning when everything was super overwhelming. I just couldn't even imagine. I couldn't pick up a book. I was just too. But mm. now we've kind mm. of been in this situation for so long. I find myself just turning to books all the time, just mm. as a, a distraction or a form of this escape. Um, are there any particular books? I know you mentioned one there, um, but there, are there any other kind of um, top books that you've read that have kind of been really transporting during lockdown or your kind of um, lockdown survival book recommendations? Oh my gosh, that's such a hard question. Um, <laughs> I'm actually reading a book that I would not let myself read. It's called The Paris Librarian. And when it came oh, okay. out, I was afraid it was my book already written by someone else and it's a murder mystery and it's set in the okay, American library different. in Paris oh, and okay. so I'm just enjoying being in the library again not as a worker um but just kind yeah. of as someone someone who's kind of eavesdropping um on this murder investigation and so it's been fun I think it was published in um 2016 by Mark Pryor um and I'm reading Bones of the Moon as well Bel Canto is a book that I return to right away and I almost can't read it anymore because I've underlined so many lines. <laughs> that That's always a good sign of a, a well-enjoyed book. By Anne Patchett and I know um, I know I enjoyed the, the Dutch House as well so by her. Amazing great well just uh, finally what can we kind of expect to see from you next? Well, you know, the, um, the book is just coming out after a long wait because it was supposed to come out June 2020. And so it's just coming out now in some different countries. So I'm just enjoying the process of um, talking about, finally being able to talk about the book with people who can actually read it. So that's kind of what's next for me. It's some, some interviews and, uh, and writing some articles about the book. And I've really just enjoying the thought of it being out and into the hands of readers. Lovely. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Janet, for speaking to me today. Um, I've got a copy of the Paris Library here. And uh, yep, yeah, it is published by Two Rose Books and is available to borrow in print and in ebook format. Um, and you can find out more by visiting your local, local library online or by using uh, a borrowing app, app such as Borrowbox or Libby. Um, and I really can't wait for other people to experience this book. And I'm sure we'll be hearing much more about it throughout the year as people um, find out about the story of Adil and Lily. Um, so thank you so much again, Janet. Thank you so much. So this has been wonderful. I appreciate it. Thank you. <laughs>